immediately back in the 40. And I came in for two nights, and they packed the place up, and we had a great time. So I have actually been here before, all the way from Michigan, if you can believe that. And so this weather ain't nothing for me. This feels... <laughs> Started to get a little cooler, but around here is freezing, putting jackets on. I'm yeah, wearing yeah. shorts and short sleeves. I'm like, this is like springtime for yeah, me. Yeah, it's yeah. not that big of a deal. But uh, I first heard about you all through uh, Pastor Scott and Shannon. I think I saw even on Facebook a little clip of them speaking here, and I was like, El Campo, man, I remember El Campo, and then I think we, we started kind of following each other on Facebook, and then I saw Dr. Hiles was here, and then Jordan, you know, and I mean, uh, you know, just come, I was with Jordan, I think just about two weeks before he came here uh, with y'all, and uh, love him and Karen, they're beautiful little babies, I'd say, they're just, uh, they got gorgeous family, and so it's just family all the way around and so it's always good to be here and uh, just a little bit about me my i've been married to the same amazing woman for 27 years uh, we just celebrated our 27th year and for our first 21 years i dragged her all over the world and my we have two children my daughter is 23 and my son is 22 and we dragged them all over the world. Their first 16 and 17 years of life, they were in 43 states, seven nations. Uh, the family traveled with me in a big van. We went everywhere together. And uh, they're still doing all kinds of stuff. My daughter's a worship pastor at a church yeah. about a half hour from us in Michigan. She is an incredible worship leader. I mean, she is kind of kind of like uh, Kim Walker Smith from Jesus wow. Culture on wow. steroids. Wow. Wow. And, awesome. and that wasn't me saying that. That was actually Danny and Sherry Silk mm. from Bethel. And Sherry used to wow. manage Jesus Culture. Wow. And so she's like, man, your girl got something going on. And then they tried to get her to move to Sacramento. And I was, I was like, no, wait a minute. You know, just wait a minute. Because <laughs> Sunday night, she's with us. Because six years ago, we started a church in Saginaw, Michigan. And Saginaw per capita for the last about 10 years has been one of the top three most dangerous cities in America. Yeah. Oh, wow. And we started in the city, we started in the hood, and uh, we started on Sunday nights. We didn't want to start Sunday mornings because I didn't want a bunch of church people. Oh. Gotta be honest, got nothing against church people, oh. but we wanted to actually repeat, reach oh. people that the church didn't know what to do with. Wow. Right. And most of them are not gonna get up at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning on their right. only day off to come visit you. Yeah, uh, yeah, most yeah, of them yeah. didn't get up until about three in the afternoon right. on Sunday <laughs> afternoon because of what they were doing on Saturday night. I'm and on. so yeah, that's yeah. who we gave and God gave wow. us a bunch of just God, just a fun group. Bunch of, so there's a bunch of gangbangers. Uh, I mean, uh, we got ex-cons. We got, we, you know, we've got bounty hunters. I mean, I mean, we just, we've got an interesting group of folks that come hang out with us. Yeah, yeah. Our church is about, about uh, 35, 40% Hispanic, about 25, 30% wow. black. And then we got a few white folk in there, and half of them are related to me. <laughs> uh, they just kind of mixed in. And uh, my, my daughter, uh, she also does worship for us on Sunday nights. Uh, but she got married then uh, a little over four years ago now and three years ago gave us the absolute greatest joy of our life our little granddaughter wow and her name is cadence grace rocha wow so we got some mexican in the family not mexican some mexican and then i can uh, I, I, I can speak un poquito you know Dios le bendiga. That's, that makes it nice and easy right <laughs> I can bust into that one anytime I want. Uh, but uh, and actually, what was funny is my daughter actually knew more Spanish than he did. Uh, yeah, that's what uh, he's like, wait a minute, what? You know. But uh, just uh, she has rocked our world. I mean, she's uh, she's at a place where now she's learned how to FaceTime me, and she'll FaceTime me. I'll get a call, and I know it's her, and, and she'll be Papa, Papa. Come take me Chuck E. Cheese. I want to go to Chuck E. Cheese. I'm like, baby, Papa's in California right now. But right, right when I get home, I'm going to take you to Chuck E. Cheese. She's enamored with Chuck E. Cheese right now. She just loves Chuck E. Cheese. She'll watch videos like all day of just people going to Chuck E. Cheese. There's like thousands of YouTube videos of people just going to Chuck E. Cheese. And I'm like, I'm like what is she watching? She's just watching people going to Chuck E. Cheese. I'm like, I don't even know what to say to that. Just when she did love and some Chuck E. Cheese right now. And so uh, my son is 22. Uh, my son is a hip hop artist, and uh, and actually uh, a, a pretty good one. He actually uh, just signed with a 
uh, a pretty major producer in Detroit who put him on a mixtape of one of the top four up and coming hip hop artists in the state of Michigan. Wow. And uh, the guy he's with has uh, an Emmy because he does all the music for the BET uh, show Empire. Wow. And then he's also produced people like Tiger and Big Sean, and, and uh, he's got three or four Grammys hanging on his wall, so he's not just some little producer oh, right, big yeah. deal. And he's yeah, falling yeah. in love wow. with my son, so we'll see where all that goes. I have, Come on, I have no idea, uh, but uh, he's a, ridiculously, both my kids, they play about every instrument you can imagine. Wow. They both sing, he produces, uh, does a little bit of everything, so they're just... They're just uh, they're pretty amazing. I'm proud of them, to say the least. I would love to take credit for all their talent, but I'm married up. <laughs> so their mama has a degree in sacred music. They get their boldness and loudness from me. Everything else comes from the mother. I have no problem saying that. All the talent just gets wrapped up all in her. She's, she's, uh, she's absolutely amazing. And so uh, um, this past year, I just turned our church over to a spiritual son. And uh, he is doing an absolute amazing job. I, I ended up having way too much on my plate. I've led a network of churches for 13 years. And uh, that, that ended up being about 20 to 24 churches and ministries, as well as about 35 preachers. But then my spiritual father, a few years ago, went on to be with the Lord. And he had talked to three of us that were uh, part of his network as sons about taking over for him. And none of us individually really felt we were supposed to do it. And so we're doing it now as a team. And that's a whole network of churches that's been around for about 38 years. They've got a campground. Wow. They got, And that kind of added about another 50 churches and 70 preachers on my plate and 400 overseas. Wow. Uh, we've, wow. got, we've got over 360 churches just in Cuba alone wow. Uh, wow. That, uh, that, that we're having some responsibility for. So just some pretty neat stuff that's going on. And so, uh, you know, I, I am here because uh, purely out of relationship. Uh, I mean, I don't I don't ever pay attention. You know, I've never asked anybody how many they're running because this isn't a cattle call. Come on, right. Yeah. I've never, I just have never done that. I mean, I'll go one week, preach to a thousand. The next week, I'll be in a house. Uh, it just doesn't matter I mean, where God connects us relationally. And so I've been looking forward to being able to meet uh, in person, Pastor Larry and Pastor Jamie, and looking forward to being able to spend some time with them. So exciting stuff. Uh, quick, I'll give a quick commercial also. Uh, right out in the little area over there, kind of the kitchen area, I have a bunch of product on the table. Uh, there was a day I used to have a mammoth table with a big display. And it looked like I had an empire, and it was really <laughs> impressive, and I had piles of CDs laying everywhere. And then you get to a certain age, and you just don't care if anybody thinks you have an empire. You know, it's, it's, I hit 50 this year, and, you know, my kids are always trying to dress me. They're like, Dad, you know, you need to look cool. And all I want to know is, is it comfortable? Uh, you know, they're like, Dad, this shirt's cool. Does it stretch? That's all I want to know. Yeah, yeah. You know they're like, Dad, you need to wear these shoes. Is there memory foam? I mean, that's all I want to know. I love Skechers. Just give me some memory foam, man. I, just, I, want, I want it comfortable. Yeah. And, uh, but but, but I, I love how the technology, I've been able to take all these CDs that uh, literally for everybody to buy all the CDs I had would have been almost a $300 package. And I'd be able to condense it down into four USBs that you can plug into your car. They're all MP3s. You can email them, do a bunch of other stuff. And there's four USBs. There's 64 hours of teaching between all four. And they're $35 a piece, so you buy three, get one free. So you get 64 hours of teaching for 100 bucks. Wow, awesome. uh, it's, it's from everything you can imagine. The Yellow Series, I'm going I'm to touch a little bit tonight uh, from the Yellow Series. It's called Love and Order, pun intended, not Law and Order. Mm but love in order and there's nine hours on agape on the love of god and really what that looks like the tangibility of it and uh, really teaching uh, a lot of first corinthians 13 what love is that you realize that love is only two things love is patient love is kind it's wow. so only two things everything else is what love is not yeah. uh, love is not easily angered it is not angry wow, it is it is it does not keep record of wrong it is not boastful it is not jealous yeah, yeah. And, and isn't it interesting though the yeah. old testament said god's a jealous god but then god is love and love isn't jealous so i'm not really sure how that works but yeah, yeah, anyway yeah. that might be a different discussion yeah. at another yeah. time i think the new covenant flipped a few more things upside down than we realize yeah mm -hmm. hallelujah i think yeah. jesus came to show us what daddy's yeah. really like yeah. Yeah. Not what we just thought that he was like. But uh, uh, then there's six hours on that same one on order, which is about government. All in fivefold ministry 
uh, apostolic order, under, understanding, I mean, we're talking apostolic, not a denomination. Right. Uh, we're, 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 we're talking right. actually how the church functioned originally in its DNA right. and how really we got off kilter uh, for a bunch of years. The Reformation brought us back in with some doctrine, but still not government. And God's trying to get us back to the original intent. And there's just some rich stuff in there, help you find your ministry gift and all that. Uh, the Blue Series out there, it's called, uh, 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 that's Metamorphosis is the right one. It's called, uh, Lord have mercy, I don't even know what my own stuff is called. <laughs> I just ordered a whole bunch of them. Uh, it's it's identify, identified as the white one, unveiled. Thank you. Uh, it finally, finally hit me. Uh, but it is 14 hours uh, that I, I taught now several years ago. Uh, it was third year curriculum for all of Andrew Womack's colleges for a couple of years. Uh, and it's all on how to understand the scriptures, how to study them, wow. how to understand them properly. Uh, how, how, we tell people all the time you need to be a good Berean and learn how to study right. the Bible for yeah. yourself. A lot of times don't teach you how to do that. Right. Yeah. And, and it actually walks you through and shows you there's more than 300 figures of speech in the Bible. It's full of idioms. It's full of hyperbole. Uh, our problem is we try to interpret a first century book with a 21st century right. mindset. Yeah. And it just gets us in all kinds of trouble and mess because we're trying to interpret stuff according to what it means to us today, right. but not according to what it actually meant to them there. Because there is only one one interpretation of every verse in the Bible, but there's many applications. Right, yeah. There's only one actual meaning, and it was who it was originally meant to be spoken to. But now, because it's alive, God knows how to peel the onion and show us there's a bunch of revelation beyond that. And it's still applicable to us today, but it was not written to any Americans in 2017. Yeah. Say that. I, mean, I, I, I know y'all have been getting some teaching here, but you know, because uh, listen, that's a shocker to most people because I was taught it was God's love letter directly to me. And, you know, I mean, it's like, man, I couldn't, I couldn't find it in there. I kept looking for this, anyway, this love letter. Just wasn't there, man. He was talking to a certain people at a certain yeah. time about specific events, yeah. about exact good, things, David. and yeah. so uh, I just go in. I also deal with every number in the Bible and their meanings, uh, all the different, all the different similes and metaphors. It's it's fourteen hours of how to understand your Bible. Great stuff. The white one is called Identified. Uh, in that one, there is eight hours on your identity in Christ, how God sees you, how He views you. Uh, there's five on grace and faith, and five on sonship, and then the red series is 14 hours I taught at a Bible school on the saving of the soul and the renewing of the mind. Mm. Uh, and not not just the Joyce Meyer type stuff. It kind of digs a little bit deeper. Joyce got good stuff. Right. But it digs a little bit deeper. Yeah. And I, I'll walk you through the whole book of Joshua and about how they had to remove uh, 30 kings before Joshua could be at rest and about how our heavenly Joshua comes into us and he wants wow. to be at rest. And how many of you know he's sweet when he comes inside? But according to the book of Revelation, he's sweet in your mouth but bitter in your belly. Because uh, yeah. he's sweet when you first taste of it. But then yeah. he begins to drive out all the yeah. nations, yeah. all the condemnations, wow. all the imaginations, yeah. all the denominations. Wow. He, yeah. he drives out all the nations and squatters. That's and I good. go through all 30 of those kings and the meanings oh, yeah. of their names. And, and about how it is a process of working out your salvation. Yeah. There's a finished work in my spirit. Right. But I need to get what's in my spirit into my soul, my mind well and emotion spilling out yeah. of my body. That's it. That's All right. right. That's why you don't work for your salvation. You work it yeah. out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's working out. It's yeah. finished in here, but I got to get, because you see, you can believe something in your heart, but if you think something different, you're going to do what you think over what you believe, because yeah. as a man thinks, right. so is he. Not as a man believes. Right. I can yeah. believe in my heart God wants me blessed, but if I'm still thinking constantly oh, about yeah. poverty, then I'm, it doesn't matter how much I believe God yeah. wants me blessed. Yeah. It's yeah. got to get in my thinking. Yes. There's got to be a transformation That's in my good. mind. Yeah. And it's, it's got to begin to change my soul and ultimately change my woman. All right. It's got to, it's, it's got to begin to, to transform my soul because uh, David made it real clear. My soul shall make her boast of the Lord. He's like, your soul is a she. And so you got, you got to get your woman saved. <laughs> that's yeah. so, right listen, that's why, that's why the, there's no accident that in, in the book of Genesis. Isn't it interesting? The enemy of, of, of our soul did not come to Adam. He came to Eve. Because uh, he, he can't mess with your spirit. The uh, only way he can even come close to getting anywhere near your spirit, he's got to come through your she to get, to get to your he. And isn't it interesting that then the promise... Wow. That God gave the serpent is from the seed of the woman. Now, women don't have seed. Women receive seed. Right. In other words, it's not till what is in your he gets in your she. What's in your spirit getting into your soul, that's when the enemy gets put under your feet. Come on. It's got, it's got to be a transformation in your thinking. And 
Hallelujah. I mean, who knows? Just, 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 just maybe, just, just maybe when, when Paul was saying to the church, I suffer not a woman to teach, maybe he wasn't talking about females at all. Maybe he was just saying, I want your soul to shut up. Anyway. And if she got a question, let her ask her husband who's at home. Maybe wow. he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit that he is saying. And see, that, 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 that is why, uh, you know, we are sons of God because the he lives in our he. But we not only need to just be a son of God, but we need to learn what it means to be his wife. And that means there needs to be an impregnation of what's in my he into my she. Yeah. And we've got to stop practicing safe church. Oh, Come on. Wow. That's good. Yeah. Uh, there, there's got to be an impregnation of life, and and, and and normally, normally worship is when uh, worship is that exciting part where he gets all excited because I mean, you know, your he's always more ready than your she. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's PG thirteen. You didn't know it's PG thirteen. Oh. <laughs> Somebody go. Wait a minute. What exactly is he talking about? Right oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a spiritual thing. <laughs> But, but somewhere, I think normally norm, normally where uh, uh, it's kind of a oops is about offering time. Because yeah. uh, it seems about all, all of a sudden about offering time, just <laughs> something gets in the way. But anyway, uh, <laughs> maybe the book of Revelation also was giving us an interesting picture when it started talking about this whore, this harlot of Babylon. Babylon is translated the seat of confusion. And it said this harlot, she lays with 17 kings. Do you know there's exactly 17 works of the flesh in the book of Galatians? Do you know that if your soul lays around with your flesh, it's always going to get in a big mess. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. going to cause you so much wow, problems and so much trouble. But anyway, anyway, I got about an hour and a half in there just on that. And I go, the Song of Solomon, there's some good stuff in there. And the he and the she. And <laughs> matter of fact, even in the Greek language, your spirit is male gendered and your soul is female. Wow. And so that, that, that's yeah. why you got to, uh, see, it's hard sometimes to, under, uh, to explain soul and spirit, but I can understand he and she. Yeah, yeah. Right. I can understand yeah. Venus and Mars. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I can understand there's a difference between a woman and a man, and, and then all of a sudden it just makes all kinds of sense, and there's all okay. kinds of beauty that yeah. takes place on it. Uh, maybe that's why in the book of Revelation, it, it said that this woman, she says, I sit a queen, and I am no widow. See, as long as your soul is convinced that she's not a widow, that her first husband, Adam, is still alive, that she's going to begin to rule as a queen. Your soul is going to rule over your body rather than allowing your spirit to do it. Your woman, your soul has to become convinced that Adam has been crucified once and for all, and she stops being queen and lets the king be the king. Hallelujah. So anyway, that, there's some fun stuff in there. So I gotta, I better get to my assignment for today. It's easy, especially on a Thursday night. Like you just want to run off and teach some of that stuff. Right? It's been a minute since I taught some of it. But uh, anyway, take your Bible. Throw me to First John, if you would. First John. First John four. I want to read a very, uh, very familiar passage, and I'm going to share a little bit of a personal story of something I went through about five or six years ago that literally, literally transformed my life. First John chapter four. I'm going to start in verse number 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believe the love that God has for us for God is love. He doesn't have love. He is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Now, love has been perfected, past tense, yeah. among us in this, that we may have boldness or fearlessness in the day of judgment. Wow. Because as he is, Jesus, so are we in this world. Yeah. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, or some translations say lead to punishment. But he who fears, now watch the context, he who still fears punishment on judgment day has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Now this, uh, this whole passage, uh, you know, first of all, I, I love how it starts. And it just says this. It says, anyone that confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, that God abides in him, and he in them. Everybody say this with me. Say, Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God. Is the Son of God. Right. Now, according to that right there, God abides in you and you in him. Isn't that deep? 
Uh, isn't it amazing? You, you don't have to go through a form of baptism. You don't right. have to. You don't have to say anything a certain way. I mean, right. that's that's all John said. John said, "Listen, this is super simple and super easy right here. If you say that you confess that He is the Son of God, then God abides in you, and you abide in Him." But then John goes on and he says something extremely interesting. He says, "For love has been perfected in us in this that we have." Boldness, fearlessness on Judgment Day. Now, my background, I, I'm, I'm third generation classical Pentecostal. Uh, my grandmother helped start what they called Brush Harbor churches in mid-Michigan. That was back in the 30s and 40s when all the Pentecostals were still having tomatoes and rotten apples thrown at them, and they would go out in the woods, and they'd clear, this is of course in Michigan, they'd clear areas of the wood, and they'd go out there, and they'd set a fire, and they'd be out there, what they call tearing, for the baptism yeah. of the Holy Spirit, because the churches wouldn't let them in, no one else would. I, I, I mean, that's that's... A huge part of my background. Uh, I, I say it a lot, just like Dr. Hiles does, because his mama and my mama are extremely similar. My mama also has a PhD, a Pentecostal hairdo. Come on, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. She doesn't have a doctor, but she she still got the white, tall hair. And I mean, I, mean, I was raised, yeah. and I, I tell people this all the time. I was raised under a gospel of fear. There yeah. was, I mean, they might talk about love once or twice a year, right. but all the fear negated everything you were ever taught about love in the first place yeah. and especially when I was growing up we would have these evangelists come from like the Carolinas and from the south and they preach start two week revival meetings it started at two weeks it would be Sunday to Sunday all the way to the next Sunday and I remember the preachers I'd be four, five, six, seven, eight years old and they'd pull out that long bony finger you know when you're sitting in the seat and that long finger would come out I mean you felt like it was five feet long it was pointing at you right on the nose and they'd say some Someday you're going to stand before God. Yeah. And that finger will be like, I don't want to stand before God someday. It's freaking me out. And they're like, you're going to stand before God. And you're going to stand before him on Judgment Day. But I was terrified of Judgment Day. I mean, you start talking about Judgment Day. I was like, dear yeah. Lord, man, yeah. what's going to happen on Judgment Day? Until one day I read that verse. Come on. And I was like, now how come no one ever taught me that verse? Yeah. Yeah. How come no one ever said that if I've confessed Jesus is the right. Son of God, I'm supposed to have no fear to yeah. stand before God on Judgment yeah. Day. Yeah. I don't have to be afraid one iota. Why? Because we are as Jesus is. Yeah. Because if yeah. we're going to be judged on judgment yeah. day, the Father's going to have to judge Jesus yeah. all over again. That is yeah. that's good news right there. Yeah. Well, you see, when you've been raised under a, a gospel of fear, yeah. which doesn't even make sense because there's no good news in fear. Amen. But when you've been raised under fear, I still remember much of the preaching that I grew up with in the 60s and 70s and even through a lot of the 80s, much of the preaching had more to do with what we were against and what we were for. Right. Most of it had so much to do. I, I, I still remember I, I was afraid to miss heaven. I was afraid to go to hell. I was terrified of missing the rapture. I, 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 yeah. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I remember coming home one time from school. We had had a 10-day prophecy seminar where, you know, my dad brought in the preacher, and they had the big, uh, you know, all up on the platform. They had all those scrolls and all of those charts and everything else. And, man, I mean, I was terrified. Then we watched these cheesy movies at the end, The Thief in the Night, A Distant Defender, oh, The Mark oh, of the Beast, yeah. and everybody's heads are getting chopped off. And I'm like seven years old, and I'm like, man, this is terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And then I come home from school a couple of days later and I run in the house. Mom, Dad, nobody's there. And I'm like, ah, I'm getting a little nervous. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I might have missed it. But then I'm like, well, sometimes they're over at the church. And so I run across the church parking lot. I run in the building. Mom, Dad, nobody's answering. Now I'm freaking out a little bit. I'm like, oh, boy, I might have missed the rapture because I was such a heathen at seven. And no one had taught me the age of accountability, for heaven's sake. So at least... Come on. <laughs> Even though it's not in the Bible, it at least would have helped me a little bit. For yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at least I'm good till he's 12, for heaven's sake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. And I remember I'm sitting there and I'm just shaking. I'm going, oh, God, God, I missed the rapture. And then all of a sudden I remember Beulah Copeland 
Sister Beulah was a lady in the church. She was the prayer warrior of the church. She was a lady that gave the message. She gave the tongues and interpretations. You'd go to her house and she'd make this beautiful spread to feed you. And then she'd pray over the food for 15 minutes. Wow. I mean, I remember sitting there at six years old smelling all this good food going, amen, amen, amen. Yeah. And she'd pray for the missionaries. And I'm like, listen, intercede on your own time. Yeah. Yeah. God's meat, let's eat. It ain't time to intercede over yeah, the meal. Yeah. For the food's going to get cold, lady, if you lost your mind. <laughs> Six-year-old boy, I'm ready to eat the wood off the table by then. <laughs> but I remembered, I was like, you know what? So I went to I, I went to the church office and I opened up the Rolodex and I found Sister Beulah's number because I know if anybody went in the rapture. Yeah, yeah. Sister Beulah went in the rapture. And so I dialed her number. <laughs> and nobody under 35 has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I dialed dialed her number and it it rang like six times and I was going, oh Jesus and finally she answers it hello, I was like, ah oh, I know I didn't miss the rapture now, I mean, but when you're raised under that yeah. kind of fear yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. man, that's good <laughs> so true. see the truth is we have nothing to be afraid of on judgment day because Jesus already dealt with all of ours Ooh, yeah. glory. amen, amen. amen. Dealt with it once and for all. Matter of fact, and some of you, you may have heard this before, but I don't like to. I don't like to ever assume. But you know, when we preachers get preaching, sometimes we, we love to quote certain verses, especially when we're getting our spit on a little bit. You know, yeah. and a preacher will get going. All of a sudden, they'll say, "Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me." You know, I remember seeing a song, you know, Clint Brown. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll yeah. draw all on me. Come on, lift him. Remember that? Yeah. Lift him up. Yeah. Lift yeah. him up. Yeah. Busted that one up. And, I, and I, I remember reading through that, but then I, I studied it one day, and it dawned on me. It says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all. And then the word men is in italics. Right. That means it was added by translators. So actually it just says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all unto myself. And so then your question has to be, well, all of what? Because lifted up means crucified. We know he was crucified. He said, if I be crucified, I'll draw all unto myself. But then to understand it, you've got to go to the verse before. Because right. the verse before, it says, now is the judgment of this world Girl, complete yeah. and the prince of this world will be judged. And I, even if I be crucified, I will draw all, not all necessarily people. He said, I'm going to draw all judgment unto right. myself. Yeah, yeah. So now you and I don't have anything yeah. to be afraid of on judgment right. day because Jesus already took it all yeah. For us, once and for all, what was meant for us, he consumed uh, to, in a beautiful, beautiful act of love. Right. And in the midst of all of that, then we've got the book of Hebrews, and we quote it all the time at funerals. At funerals, we'll get up and we'll say, it is appointed unto man wants to die after that, the judgment. And we say, see, you're going to stand before God in judgment, but then we don't read the rest right. of the verse. Yeah, the rest on. of the verse says, even so, oh, yeah. Christ yes. died. In other words, exactly. he already took care yes, of it for he did. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we have no fear on Judgment Day, for we are as Jesus is on the earth. One translation says we are identical to Jesus. What's true of him is now true of us. But then John says this, and this is where I want to head for a few minutes. He said, perfect love removes all fear. But I realized something. If love removes fear, then the opposite is true, and fear removes love. And what I found is people that have been raised under a message of fear, they have a hard time many times receiving love, and they have a hard time giving love. Right. Mm. Because all they know is fear. God to them was someone to be terrified of. Yeah. My, my dad's favorite verse for years was the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. I remember I looked at him one day, I said, well, Dad, that was true in the Old Covenant. But the fear of the Lord might get you to God, but it can't keep you and can't complete you because it is perfect love that removes all. It doesn't just remove a little bit of fear. Love removes fear, but then also fear removes love. Wow. That's I cannot be intimate with someone I'm terrified of. Wow. Absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. To try to tell people that you've got to fear God. Now, in the New Covenant, in the book of Hebrews, it calls it the spirit 
of the fear of the Lord, which is awe, honor, respect, not terror. Because if this Abba that I'm serving, this Abba that I love, if he is my Abba, if he's my father, and he's someone I'm terrified of, it would be like, it would be like if my wife would have told me one day that when I would at times fly to certain places, most of the time my family were with me, but I wouldn't have drive all the way to California. And so I'd fly, but if my wife would have told me, when you came home, when the kids heard the garage door go up, they ran to their rooms in terror. Because, uh-oh, daddy's home. That was kind of the God I was raised with. You better watch it, because when he comes someday, he's coming on a white horse. He's going to be coming with a sword. He's going to be slaughtering all of his enemies. I, mean, I, I still remember that prophecy seminar that my dad had. Ten days. I was, I was, I think, seven, eight, nine years old right in there. This might have been a second one that he did. Because I remember, because we did him quite a bit. I was, I'm pretty sure I was nine at the second one. My dad looked at me, we're having supper, and he said, so son, what did you think of all that teaching the last 10 days? I said, well, in a nutshell, I guess we that have believed in Jesus and prayed the right prayer, we get to leave for seven years and go sip some lemonade and tea and hang out with Jesus and have a party in heaven while all of our family and friends who didn't pray the right prayer and didn't believe are getting their heads chopped off. Right, yeah. Then at the end of seven years, we get to come back on a white on a spirit horse yeah, with right. Jesus and slaughter That's everybody it. else on the yeah, planet. Yeah. Is that about right? My dad was like, well, well kind of. I said, I'm not interested. Oh, wow. <laughs> Nine years old. I'm like, are you kidding me? I don't want to come back and kill my friends. I mean, I mean, what kind of sick God is this you're trying come to on. teach me about? Yeah, come on. That's good. And then you tell me God is love, and then you tell me that Jesus told us to love our enemies, but he's going to come back and slaughter all of his? Kind of makes him a little bit of a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. wow. Woo, good teaching, brother. Huh? That's good. That's good. <laughs> good stuff. I mean, that's kind of like saying, do what I say, but not as I <laughs> Not as I do. I'm not supposed to render evil for evil, but he will. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to turn the other cheek, but he will. <laughs> if I'm as he is on the earth, then yeah. I follow what he taught. Yeah. Because he doesn't have love. He is love. Oh, yes. right. Perfect love removes all fear, but when you've been raised with nothing but fear, you have to go through a process. Sometimes it can be an instantaneous experience that transforms everything, but sometimes it's it's like leaven. You have to get rid of all the yeast, and all of a sudden, the more love comes in, the more fear goes out. The more you know he is love, the more the fear goes out, and there's been a war going on for thousands of years between love and fear. The greatest war on the planet is, is not good and evil. It's love and fear. People hate. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is fear. Because the only reason people hate is because they fear something. Yes. Yeah. When you're in fear, you then hate what you're afraid of. It's, it's just a response that humans have. But perfect love removes fear but if if I'm so my theology is getting simpler the older I'm getting God's not giving us the spirit of fear so if I'm sitting and I'm listening to someone proclaiming what is supposed to be the gospel and it's producing fear in me yeah. it lets me know it's not the gospel mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why the more you hear truth, you just can't watch Christian TV That's much anymore. Right. Say that. There's only maybe two or three people you can watch, and yeah. sometimes yeah. even then it make you scratch Say your that. head on some stuff. I, I mean, because after a while, you're like, man, the mixture brings confusion in your yeah. life, and all of a sudden, I mean, yeah. you're, you're freaking out a little bit because you're like, wait a minute, now. I don't even know if I can watch this because yeah. it's causing a stomach ache in me, yeah. because it's causing me to vomit. Why? Because I'd rather you be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, and there's a spinning that happens. Why? What is lukewarm? It's mixture. When you mix hot and cold. Yeah. When you're sitting and listening to a message of mixture, it does not produce love and faith in you. It actually yeah. produces... Oh. Oh, come on, that's good, That's James. good. Man, that that's good. good. Amen. That's why you just, people that blessed you five years ago, you're like, man, I, I love you and God bless you. I just can't listen to you. No that's more. right. Yeah. Amen. It doesn't mean I'm against you. I'm still for you. Right. You're still my brother, but Lord have mercy. Yeah. I can't listen to it. That's why, I, you know... Wow. 
I remember I asked the Lord several years ago, I said, Lord, I get one thing, guys, that preach the new covenant and the gospel of the kingdom of grace, one thing we get blamed for all the time is you're preaching a message that all these people with itching ears want to hear. Yeah. I, I mean, I always hear this itching ear thing. Like, <laughs> like you just, you're just an itching ear preacher. Yeah. And I got thinking about it one day, and I said, okay. I, and, and you go to that passage where Paul's telling Timothy. And Paul's telling Timothy, first of all, earlier in the, in the chapter, mm -hmm. make sure that the message that I gave you, this is the one you're preaching. Right. Paul was the grace preacher. If you want it. All right. he, he, he's the one that coined it the gospel of grace and then he starts talking about watch out for those that are constantly preaching myths and fables yeah. All right, they're, they're, they're preaching a bunch of Greek mythology right. <clears throat> which is a lot of what we've been taught about a lot of things Okay, <laughs> just Greek mythology, watch out for all them he said for some are going to come and all they're going to want to do is tickle people's ears and give them what their itching ears want. And that's why several years ago, the uh, Lord gave me gave me the clear message about Peter cutting off Malchus's ear. Peter is translated stone. He's a picture of a preacher who's been under law his whole life, under the stone, and he's met Jesus, but he's still struggling with mixture. And so he takes out the sword, he takes out the scriptures, and he cuts off the ear of Malchus. Malchus is translated reigning king. Anytime you get around reigning kings, our job is not to chop their ear off. Our job is to heal their hearing, not to cut off their hearing and it is a picture of a law preacher who's constantly cutting off your hearing week after week after week after week because the law shuts up faith and if you want itching ears if you cut off someone's ear it's going to start itching i just submit to you that itching ear preaching is law preaching and not grace preaching yes, come on. amen that is good good you're doing good good stuff i want to run off there for 10 minutes but i got to stay focused come on that's good good stuff so that's why the law of sin and death cuts off your hearing constantly. That, that, that's why some of us sat in church for years, had our ear chopped off every other week. Yeah, yeah. Had law and mixture preached to us. And rather than be confident sons, rather than walk around knowing that I'm loved of the Father, I am his son and who he is well pleased, I walked around going, he loves me, he loves me not. Yeah, he loves yeah, me, he loves yeah, me yeah, not. Yeah. I'm in the kingdom. I think I just got kicked out. Yeah, My yeah, name's yeah. in the book. I think it just got yeah. erased. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Constant, constant fear, insecurity. How can you grow into a mature son? Because all creation is not groaning for a manifestation of the son. All creation is groaning for a manifestation of the weos, the mature sons of God. How can we become a mature son if we're not even convinced, first of all, that we're sons that the Father is in complete love with and he's pleased with us because we're constantly having our hearing. It's constantly chopped off. We got churches full of reigning kings. Yeah. Who our message should be you're a king and a priest. Yeah. You're a son of the most high. Do yeah. you know who you are? Yeah. You know who your daddy is. You know how you were put on this planet to rule and reign. Don't you know how special you are in the eyes of the Father? Instead, you're a worm. You're a sinner. Yeah. Don't you know that there's none righteous? No, not one. Not one. <laughs> <laughs> Man, cutting the ear off week after week after week. But what does Jesus do? He says, "Peter, put the sword away." Yeah, yeah, yeah he does. Never told you to use it. I just told you to bring it. Right, right. And the only reason I told you to bring the sword is to fulfill a scripture because it must be, it must be fulfilled as the prophets said yeah. that the Son of Man must be taken as a criminal, mm -hmm. because to the Romans, if there were ten or more men with at least two swords. Uh, it was called insurrection, and you would be then grabbed as a criminal. Jesus couldn't go to the cross as a martyr. He had to go to the cross as a criminal. That's why just before they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, I've told you in the past, don't take any swords, don't take a script, but now I'm telling you, take some extra clothes, take some extra money, and get a sword. And one of them says, Master, we have two. And he says, that's enough. That verse bugged me for a long time. I'm like... But he told 12 guys to grab a sword. And they said, we've got two. And he said, that's enough. Because when you study it out, you understand Jesus wasn't saying, I want all of you to grab a sword because now I'm going to give you the permission to start cutting on people. What he was saying is, I've got to fulfill a verse in the scriptures of the Old Testament and that the Son of Man must go to the cross as a criminal. And now that there's more than 10 of us and we got two swords, now I can be arrested as a criminal. The problem is Peter took up the sword and he used it. Yeah. Jesus said, now listen, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And he reaches down. The law of sin and death cuts your hearing off. The law of life and love reaches down, picks up your ear, and heals it. Wow. Yeah. Yes. 
That's the heart of Jesus. What does love do? It heals your hearing. Amen. Does not destroy it. It does not kick it to the curb. It lets you know that this is who you are. You are as Jesus is on the earth. Perfect love removes all fear. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Yes. Wow, that's good stuff. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but power, mm -hmm. love, soundness of mind, self discipline. That is his heart for us. And so. I guess my question is, if, if, if love removes fear, he goes on to then say this, for fear leads to torment mm. or punishment. What is it about us that wants people punished? Because love doesn't punish. Love corrects. Uh, I was taught that how you how you discipline your children is you punish them. That's not the Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father corrects. Correction is always done in love, not punishment. Matter of fact, we're living in a day now where there's enough information out there and there's been enough studies that show punishing children does not change their behavior. Because you don't punish sickness out of people. Wow. See, that, that's why Jesus on the cross, that's why the idea of penal substitution, the, the idea of God punishing Jesus because he wanted to punish right. us. Listen, sin was a sickness. You don't punish sickness out of people. You heal it out yeah, of people. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Come on. God wasn't the idea of right. trying to punish mankind. Right. Matter of fact, the heart of the Father was always to heal mankind. That's why Adam and Eve, they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they hide from God. And God says, where are you? Notice that their sin did not separate God from them. Man. Matter of fact, they hid from God. God came down still looking for them. Yeah. He didn't freak out in their sin. Yeah, like where, grace, where, where sin abounds, grace super abounds. Yeah. God don't run from sin. He runs towards yeah. sin. Yeah. And he runs and he gets close enough to them where he puts some clothes on them. He touches their sin. Then their firstborn son, Cain, kills his brother. God doesn't come down and destroy him and say, you should die, you filthy, rotten sinner. I'm going to punish you. Instead, yeah. he touches him on the forehead, puts a mark on him, and protects him. Yeah. Gives him Ooh. grace. Matter of fact, touch the sinner. Come on. Man, that's good. Ooh. Yeah. That messes with religious people. It does. Right yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it does. And now people say, well, what about what about the flood of Noah? He gave them over a hundred years to build boats. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> sure did. I mean, I don't know if you, I don't know how much grace that you can have. I mean, Noah went in every day. Hey, listen, there's a flood coming. Yeah. I'm building a boat. You can all get on it. And guess what? You guys can build some boats. You ain't got to die. Yeah. God's heart and His grace is still there for you, but no, well, it wasn't. But there's something about humans. That we want someone who's hurt us to be punished. Yeah. We like the idea of that bully getting his. That person that hurt me and harmed me. Mm. But yet Jesus is our example. Yeah. And while Jesus is hanging on the cross... And he's being spit on. He's being hit. He was whipped. He was attacked. Pretty much humanity looking at him and flipping him off and saying, we hate you. His response was, I forgive you. Yeah. His response wasn't, I'm going to call down 10,000 angels and slaughter you all because yeah. that's what the law would do. Because the law, Romans 4 tells us, inflicts punishment. Instead, Jesus was showing us a whole new way. He said, let me show you how love responds how love responds when it's being attacked is forgiveness. How love responds is not retribution. How love responds is not, you wait, you're going to get yours, I can't wait to punish you. Love's response is weeping over Jerusalem, yeah. saying, I see what's coming, right. and, it, and my heart is not for this destruction. My heart is for you. If you were to listen to what I said, this wouldn't have happened. There's an army that's coming in 40 years, and it's going to literally knock this place down. But my heart, if you would have listened to me, right. and he's weeping yeah. because it was not his heart. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's good. Because there's no punishment in love. 
Love doesn't inflict punishment because love is patient. Yeah. Love is kind. Love is not envious. Love is not boastful. Love is not easily angered. That's the tough one right there. Yeah. <laughs> but there's even a harder one. Love keeps no record of wrong. Yeah. Wow. Ouch. You realize that means God keeps no record. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. I remember my wife and I were engaged, and I traveled down here in Texas on an internship from college with another man doing traveling ministry. My first revival I ever preached was El Dorado, Texas. Second one was Electra, Texas. Then Byers. Then Troy. And then over in Athens, Texas. And then Waco. I've been coming down here for 28 years. Wow. The church I was at this past Sunday in Athens, I preached for them every year for 28 years. Wow. And they still let me around and say, it's absolutely a miracle. <laughs> we still like each other. <laughs> that is rare. <laughs> We've grown together, which has been a beautiful thing. I think that's always God's heart. But uh, I, I remember the church, my wife flew down to be a week with me. We were engaged, and she stayed with a little older lady in the church. And they found out that my wife could play the piano and sing. And so during the week, they wanted her every night to do this song out of a hymn book. Now, I was raised under hymns of glorious praise and melodies of praise. But they had one called Songs We Sing. I'd never heard of that one. That was all new to me. And there was a song in there, and they wanted it every night. And these folks would run around the building and shout over this song. And I remember standing on the platform the first time they sang it. I'm thinking, why are they getting excited about this song? Because the song just went, my Lord keeps a record. My Lord keeps a record. It's all about God like keeping record of everything you've ever done. And I'm like, why are you shouting to this? I mean, you should be like climbing under the pew, like horrified by that. Yeah, yeah. God's keeping a record. Woo! I mean, what? That's not exciting. <laughs> that didn't bring any shout out of me whatsoever. That was a, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. But you see, love keeps no record of wrong. Perfect love removes all fear because fear leads to punishment. Isn't it interesting that Jesus shows up and there's a woman brought to him one day in the act of adultery and Jesus' response is not law. The Pharisees' response was law. We need to stone this harlot. We need to punish her because the law demands punishment and retribution. Jesus asked the question. He said, wait a minute, who among you here?" is without sin. Then he turns to her and he says, I don't condemn you. This is how love responds to your sin. I don't condemn you. And then most of our Bibles go on to say, go and sin no more, but it's not the original Greek. It was added by translators. Jesus never said, go and sin no more. Because Jesus would have never told someone pre-cross to go do something he knew they couldn't do. Right. Mm. Wow. Wow. Come on. <laughs> what you think about that for a minute? Wow. Jesus telling someone before the cross, go and sin no more. I mean, anyway, <laughs> I mean, he's not going to say that because obviously she's going to go sin some more, okay? Right. I mean, why? Because sin hadn't been dealt with yet. Wow. Right. Come on. Yeah. And it was just added. That's why it's in italics, okay? All Jesus said was, I don't condemn you. But you know what? People that translate the Bible just couldn't handle it. That's just too good. That's just too gracious. I mean, I mean you got to add something in there. Now go and sin no more. Just make sure. Wow. <laughs> Same thing with Roman with Romans 8. There is there now no condemnation yeah. of those who are in Christ Jesus. Woo! Good news. Yeah. And then you know the translators had to add something. It can't just be no condemnation. Yeah, that's right. No, now to those who walk okay. in the spirit, not after the flesh. Right. We gotta add a yeah. work to it yeah. because yeah. we couldn't let the good news be that good. Right. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. you're right. Wow. Mm. Yeah, that's why that's why Paul tells us. Study your Bible, not read it. I won't say that. There's a lot of people that read it. Yeah. But reading and studying is not the exact same thing. And so here, what is it about us that wants people punished? The healthy response is when someone harms us, is I forgive you. 
the Jesus response is I don't want any retribution on you. I don't, I don't want harm to come to you even though you've harmed me. I made up my mind to walk in forgiveness and not walk in bitterness towards you. I know you hurt me and it's real and it hurt. But I don't want you punished. I want you redeemed. You see, there's even a lot of folks that sit in church every week that still love the idea Mm-hmm. Of people getting theirs. Yes, yeah. that's true. Amen. Someday you're gonna get yours. Wow. Yeah. God's gonna come back someday yeah. <laughs> and get you. Yeah. And then we wonder why they don't want to come to church. Come on. That's right. <laughs> I remember driving by, by the church up near Chicago one day. My daughter and I, we were doing Christmas shopping just before Christmas by my in-laws, and we drove by the church, and there was a sign out front, and the sign said. Jesus is coming really soon. And boy, is he mad. Wow. And then he said, come meet him Sunday morning at 1045. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter said, Dad, you got to turn around. I got to take a picture. I got to put that on Facebook. I, I mean, I, I mean, come, I mean come, come meet the ticked off dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's really mad. Because he's really ticked off. <laughs> It's like that meme on Facebook, you know, he's standing at the door and he's knocking and he's saying, let me in. Yeah, the person yeah. says, why should we, why should we let you in? He said, because uh, I want to save you. Well, what happens if I don't let you in? What are you saving me from? From what I'm going to do to you if you don't let me in? Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, we, we've, been, we've been sharing such mixed messages. I mean, we talk about love out of one side of our mouth and then... And then we want God to get people out of the other side. I've, I've run into so many preachers through the years that tell me, well, you know, there's a couple that used to come to my church and they caused me some problems. Or there was a young man in Absalom that was a part of my ministry and he ran off yeah. with some folks. And, you know, a couple years later, his whole marriage fell apart and now he's sick. And yeah. I'm, you know, hey, yeah. I'm not saying God wow. did it. You're right about that. <laughs> come on. Yeah. I look right at him and say, you're right. You're not saying God did it because he had nothing to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> There might be some sowing and reaping situations in people's lives, but don't go blaming God yeah. for any of that mess. Why? Because yeah. God is not in the business of that. Love does not respond that way. Humans respond that way. Yeah. Right. Amen. 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 Love doesn't. So let me let me wind this down. Are we doing all right? Yeah, man. No, 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 no. I'm having fun. Anyway. That's good. That clock hasn't been set back, Bishop. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a head step. He's like, he's like, just keep going. Right? Keep going. <laughs> For a lot of years, I, uh, I've been preaching 20 years before I did the whole series that I taught at home on love. And I, I went through nine weeks. I actually scheduled myself because when we started the church, I, I started it with a team of sons and daughters that were teachers and preachers. And uh, I would just be there twice a month. So I was leading it, but others were pastoring it and teaching and really taking care of, of the house. Because I had too much responsibilities in the road and everything else. But uh, I scheduled myself to be home for nine weeks straight because I, I just really felt this urgency to dive in, to really teach. The Lord dealt with me and he said, we're to be rooted and grounded, not in grace. You're not rooted and grounded in faith. You're not rooted and grounded in authority. You're not rooted and grounded in power. You're rooted and grounded in love. No. And he said, the foundation, isn't it interesting that God uses, he uses a building term and he uses a agricultural term. I want you rooted and I want you grounded. I want you established and, 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 and I want it to be a strong building in your life. But what I want the foundation of everything you do as a believer to flow out of is a foundation of love, not a foundation of faith. I was raised in a foundation of faith. I was raised in a foundation of authority, a foundation of power. Yeah. But not a foundation of love. Yeah. And so I, 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 I taught for nine weeks, and then I got on, a, I got on an airplane to fly to, to L.A. to speak for a friend of mine in Pomona, California. And I had a, a layover for a couple hours in Chicago, and when I was there, I got off the plane, and there was a, a, a message, a text, from a friend that said, hey, have you read... Billy Graham's grandson's new book, One Way Love. 
I'm like, no, but you know, it's got love in it, so I'm gonna hurry up and buy it and download it into my into my uh, device. And I started reading it, and I knew I was in trouble. I had a four-hour flight from Chicago to L.A. Thank God there was a middle seat open, and then there was a little older lady sitting by the window, and, and it was a night flight, so it was dark. And I started reading the book, waiting for to get on the airplane, and I, I couldn't stop crying. And now you got to understand, I, I, I'm, I'm almost 100% A personality. I mean, my love language is acts of service. I loved the law. I was good at it. I knew how to put you under it. I knew how to manipulate you with the law. I knew how to get money out of you. Matter of fact, I mean, man, I've let folks know you better not go on vacation until you leave your tie. Your car's breaking down. You're going to get cancer. Wow. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, listen. Listen, I know what I'm talking about. My song, my mantra was a song that the Ramah singers from Tulsa, Oklahoma sang in the 90s. And it was, you better get in, get out, or get run over. I mean, that was my song. It was, my mindset was get in with what God's doing with me. Get out of my way or I'm going to run you over in the name of Jesus. Because <laughs> that's what Jesus would do. Yeah, he'd run people over. That's what I was around. That's all I... That was the gospel I knew. Yeah. And God began to give me a revelation of, of grace and righteousness. And that started a huge transformation. And, and, and man, for now the last 18 years at least, but... It wasn't until now, nearly six years ago, on that airplane, and I was a person, I'd cry about twice a year. I, I was more of a laugher and a shouter. When I got blessed, I'd shout and I'd laugh. And, uh, I just didn't, wasn't much of a crier. On the plane, I, I'm reading through this book, and I could not stop sobbing. Mm. I don't know how to explain it other than just it was like, it was like liquid love poured over me for four hours. And wouldn't go away. I had to keep going to the bathroom and like washing my face out. A little lady next to me, she said, are you okay, young man? I'm like, I'm okay. I mean, I'm just, I'm reading something that's doing something that's touching me. You know, and I'm trying to explain to her. And, and I'm, I'm, God's rocking me. It lasts for a week. My friend picks me up at LAX and he's like, dude, are you all right? I mean, my eyes are all bloodshot. I mean, I couldn't stop crying. I'm trying to explain to him. But I have a 40 minute drive up to And he's like, all right, man, whatever. And you know, I'm like, I'll be able to preach. Don't worry about it. I read the book two more times over a three day period can't stop crying then I go back to LAX to fly back to Chicago and someone at the airport at LAX says have you read Danny Silk's book loving loving our kids on purpose and I'm like no but it's got love in it so I guess I might as well buy that one too and I download it and then I cry for four hours back because Danny Danny starts talking about in that book that our number one job as parents is not to teach our kids how to behave but teach them how to love Wow. and I realize I didn't even know how to know. All I knew was fear. Yeah. I understood God's grace for me, but I realized even though I understood God's grace by the time my kids were like nine or ten years old, I was still raising them under law because that's all I knew to do. Yeah. Yeah. And then he said one thing in the book. He said our number one job as parents is to keep a heart connection with our children. And he said, every parent knows when their heart gets disconnected. They just don't know what to do about it. They can feel when their child no longer is receiving from them or wants anything mm -hmm. to do with them. And now that had never happened with my daughter, but I had felt over the year before that that it happened with my son. It was just a disconnect. We, I would try to connect with him, and just there was a disconnect, and I didn't know what to do about it. And I'm reading that book. I'm flying, and I'm, I'm just crying, and the Holy Spirit shows me three specific times. Once when he was seven, when he was nine, and when he was 12, things that I did that started to turn his heart away from me. So I landed in Chicago, and I, and I called my wife, and I said, uh, make sure that the kids are at the house when I get home. Uh, my flights are all on time. I, I want to be able to meet with the whole family. And I, I got home, and I got off the plane at the airport, and she's like, are you all right? What in the world's going on? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm going to explain in a few minutes. I get home. I have my family sit on the couch, and I get on my knees 
First of all, in front of my wife, and I, I said, listen, I mean, you're my best friend. And I love you, but I've never really known how to accompany you. I've never really known how to love you that way. Um, I know how to phileo. Definitely Errol, some of you got two kids. Probably. Love you that way. I, I love my children according to like C.S. Lewis would call it storage or storge love. I mean, I give my life for my kids, but but at agape, it's a one-way love that expects nothing in return. Mm -hmm. It's a love that says, I love you whether you do what I say or not. I love you whether you obey me or not. I love you just one way. The love that God has for us is not contingent on our love back for him. Right. It's on his faithfulness, not our faithfulness. Yeah. That is why John says, here is love. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us. John's like, listen, the new covenant's going to flip the switch. In the old covenant, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, but now it's not about your love for him. It's about his love for you. Yeah. He said, now I'm here to show you something, man. So that is why, that is why, I, that is why, I mean, I, that, that picture at the cross where you've got the three Marys and then you've got the disciple the Lord loved. And, uh, you know, I, I believe it was probably John. It, it could have been Lazarus. And, you know, there's discussions about that. <laughs> but at the foot of the cross, regardless, there was a disciple that felt he still had access to come into the presence of Jesus, mm. even though all the disciples had rejected him. Yeah. Mm. Peter wasn't coming into the presence of Jesus. Peter ran because Peter was still struggling with law. I messed up. I didn't yeah. love him enough. I didn't serve him enough. I didn't do enough. I can't, I can't come into his presence because I messed up. But somehow, somehow this disciple decided I still have access to his presence. I believe it was John because John then in 1 John makes it clear and he says this is what love is. Not that I loved him, but that he loved me. John understood something pre-cross that was going to be a post-cross revelation. And that is that, that God's love for me is not contingent on my love for him. It's on his love for me and his faithfulness. Yeah, Period. Yeah. And so I then went to each of my kids and I, I got on my knees and I said, I need you to forgive me for being a donkey, except I King James to Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> our family rules. And I got to my son and I said, uh, I said, Brandon, our hearts have become disconnected because when you were seven, I did this. When you were nine, I said this. And when you were 11, I tried to make you like me and I didn't celebrate you for you. And I did the best I could, but I screwed up big time in a lot of ways and I ask your forgiveness in my my son just fell apart. Sat there and just started crying and then the whole family was a mess. And I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna commit that the rest of my life, I'm gonna do everything I know to, to love you all that way. And I've still made mistakes since then. But it took coming to a place of humbling myself because a lot of times I think parents want their children to come to them when Malachi says the hearts of the fathers are turned first. Yeah. Mm, that's good. The hearts of the parents must be turned first then the hearts of the sons and daughters right. will be turned and it, it amazes me the, the pride a lot of times in parents they know they're disconnected from their kids and they want the kids to come and bow in front of them when it should be our job. We're the mature ones to get on our knees in front of our family and say, I did all that I knew, but I didn't really know. Wow. And it's amazing how they'll forgive us. <laughs> Good, they're not they don't get angry about it they're blown away because God gives grace to the humble grace began to flood into my whole family because what I realized is that there was too much fear in the house because love and fear have been in a been in a war for a long time and it wasn't until I got to a place where I had an experience with that love now I can't hardly preach anything else. Yeah. 
I can't treat people the way that I used to. I now see every human as a child of God, whether they see themselves that way or not. I see every human as part of God's offspring. He's the God and Father of every family named in heaven and named in earth. I don't see anybody that's not one of his children. I have to see them that way so I can honor the imago Deo. I don't honor the image of God on the inside of them. Because Jesus came, according to Hebrews chapter 2, Jesus came to bring many sons to glory. And notice it doesn't say he came to bring sons to heaven. Right. He came to bring sons to glory. He didn't come to just get people to heaven. That word glory, doxa in the Greek, is translated. That he came to bring many sons to honor, to value, to worth, and to approval. His purpose in coming was to let a bunch of orphans know they're no longer orphans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Your identity has been messed up. That they got screwed up with Adam, but now I'm here to tell you who you really are. Yeah. That's why he sees Nathaniel. Nathaniel has made fun of him under a tree. Matter of fact, when they come to Nathaniel and say, this is the Messiah, he said, ah, he's just like all these other guys. But when Nathaniel comes walking to Jesus, Jesus knew what Nathaniel had just done. But what does he do? He points at him, and he speaks not to the sin in him. He speaks to the son in him. And he says, behold, a man in whom there is no guile. I mean, how beautiful is that? He doesn't look for what's wrong with Nathaniel. He looks for what's right with Nathaniel. He speaks to the purpose on the inside of him. It says immediately Nathaniel becomes a disciple. Not a believer, a disciple. I wonder what would happen if we'd stop speaking to the sin in people and start speaking to the son in them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Glory. Amen. See, God had me do this. When we when we started our church, he told me, he said, I'm going to send you a bunch of people that no one in this area would know what to do with. And so he sent me a bunch of these big old boys. I got some big old boys. I mean, three, four hundred pounders and big old boys. <laughs> and every time I'm home, it's been, some of them now have been with us for the last five or six years. And even though I'm not even, quote unquote, pastor in the house anymore, when I walk in the building, they're, they're watching. And I start making my way over towards them and they're waiting. Because I walk up and I say, hey, Junior. Hey, James. Hey, Hector. And I hit him on the chest and I say, you're better than you think you are. Wow. You're better than you're acting. And I'm going to keep telling you who you are and you start acting like it. Every single time I walk up, I hit him on the chest. Hey, big boy. You're better than you think you are. You're better than you're acting. And I'm going to keep telling you who you are until you start acting like it. Yeah. I'm not going to speak to the sin in you. I'm going to speak to the son in you. Hallelujah. The ministry of affirmation works so much better than the ministry of condemnation. Ooh, that's good. Affirming who they now are rather than trying to beat up who they used to be. Mm. Perfect love removes all fear because fear leads to torment. It leads to punishment. See, then I knew God had, had done something pretty intense in me because for about six months... I think my wife kind of got tired of it a little bit because we'd just be watching cartoons with my granddaughter. And uh, I'd start crying. And she'd be like, I'm like, suck it up, big boy. You know what? <laughs> she wasn't used to me being that way. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like, really, what happened to my husband? I knew God had done something in me because I got on the airplane to fly to Colorado Springs to teach in the college out there. And I got an upgrade into business class and love upgrades. I sit down next to a man, and, and the man introduces himself to me. And I could tell right away he's probably 58 near 60. And he'd been out of the closet for several years. You know, and he was like, hey, how are you? <laughs> he'd been fully out for a while, you could just tell. And so we take off in the plane, and... and we get up a little bit, and then, you know, they bring us some to eat and stuff. And he starts talking with me, and he says, so, by the way, what do we do for a living? Now, I never tell people I'm a preacher, because then all of a sudden, you know, they stop cussing, and, yeah. you know, or, or they say to you, you know, please, you know, last 10 minutes, forgive me for all my French, you know. I'm like, 
I don't know a lot of French people, but they must be cussers. That's all I know. I mean, <laughs> no one ever says, forgive me for my Spanish. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know some Spanish cuss words. I just don't know French ones. <laughs> Nobody says, forgive me for my German. You know, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. just, forgive me for my French. I don't, maybe I'll get to know some French people someday. I don't know. Just, <laughs> must be cussers. That's all I know. <laughs> So I said, what do you do for a living? I never tell anybody I'm a preacher, but I don't lie to them either. I said, I, I troubleshoot for nonprofit corporations. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. Oh, good. No, I'm not lying. That's literally what I do. Most of the time. And so he got intrigued with it. He's like, that's interesting. How does that work? And so I started talking to him about, you know, I mean, every nonprofit has, you know, they have a board, they have a leadership yeah, team, yeah. they have this, and I'm helping these people with this. And, you know, most most all corporations, there's people issues and learning to get people along. And about 50 minutes of the conversation, he looks at me and says, you're a preacher, aren't you? <laughs> and I'm not going to lie to him. I said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a preacher. And he said, I don't believe you. Wow. I said, well, I'm not lying. I am. I said, he said, I still don't believe you. I said, why would you say that? He said, I've never been around a preacher in my life, let alone a Christian, that I've not felt completely judged, yeah. ashamed, and miserable. Wow. Mm -hmm. He said, I've not felt an ounce of it coming from you. And I looked at him and I said, can I be honest with you? He said, yes. I said, six to nine months ago, you might have. And he said, what do you mean? I said, six or nine months ago, I would, I would not have been ugly to you. But the moment you start talking to me, I would have probably just rolled over and just turned my head and took a little nap and really not engaged much with you. I wouldn't have been mean, but I just wouldn't engage. He said, well, what changed? And so I start talking to him about my Chicago to LAX flight with all this liquid love pouring over me. And as I'm telling him, it starts happening. And we're sitting on the airplane. All of a sudden, he starts crying. And he's like, what's going on? What is this? And I'm like, I, I, he's like, do you feel that? I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I feel that. And he said, what is this? I'm like, I'm like, that's what I experienced. It's like this liquid love of God pouring over us. And he said, I don't know what to do with this. This is amazing. He said, I've never felt anything like this in my life. And he said, but it can't be God. And I said, why? He said, because all you preachers have told me he can't love me. I'm a sodomite. I'm going to hell. He hates me. Yeah. Don't you know God hates fags? Mm, wow. Mm. Wow. I said to him, I said, no, Christians have. Yeah. But God doesn't. Right. Wow. And we just sat there for 20 minutes and enjoyed the love of God, and we just sat and cried. Mm. I didn't turn to him and say, now repent. Yeah. You filthy little rotten heathen. <laughs> <laughs> Just sat there and loved them. Yes. I realize it's not my job to change people. It's yeah, my right. job to love people. That's right. That's right. It's my job to allow this amazing love to remove fear from people because the Lord then reminded me of something. The town I live in was the town my parents came from, and so we have a lot of family there. 20 years ago, I remember my mother pulled me aside one day and she said, a couple of your girl cousins, they told me that they're uncomfortable around you. And I said, okay. So my mom said to my cousin, so why are you uncomfortable around Jamie? They said, we feel like he sees right through us. Well, my mom told me that. I was like, that's right. That's the anointing. <laughs> the man of God is in their presence. The prophet yeah, right, yeah, is standing yeah. in their midst yeah. and they're under conviction. Yeah, that's right. In my holy presence. I was proud of it. I mean, I was proud of it for a lot of years. My cousins are miserable in my presence. <laughs> and they should be miserable in my presence because I know what they're doing. <laughs> And the Holy Spirit reminded me of something. And he said, I want you to go through the Gospels and try to find one time where anyone felt uncomfortable in Jesus' presence. Mm -hmm. And I made it a daily prayer that I pray every day in some form. Father, I want everyone I come in contact with to feel safe mm -hmm. in my presence. I don't want to exude fear. I want people to be able to come and sit down and feel safe with me. 
because people came and felt safe with Jesus. Mm -hmm. I believe Jesus had such an amazing heart that you could unload all of your issues, even though he already knew them, and he'd just sit and listen. And his heart would be to just encourage you and not judge you. I believe that the heart of Jesus, and I believe because we are as he is on the earth, that he wants us to so walk in this kind of love that all of our family and friends, listen, stop, please stop giving your family the finger. Just stop it. Come on. The world gives a finger and it's offensive. This one's worse. Yeah. It's time to holster the finger of shame and stop trying to point out what's wrong with all of them because it's not working. Yeah, right. yeah. It's not working. Yeah. Well, why don't we try just radically loving them? Yeah. Why don't Why don't we just make up our mind that our job is not to be the sheriffs of righteousness, Come on. but it's to radically love people. I let me. I'm gonna stop with this. I have a young man in our church, and uh, his name is James. And James is my boy, James. Seven years ago was probably one of the one of the main dealers in our town. He's a tough kid. He's been on the street since he was nine. He's part of Latin Kings for a little while. Um, still a bounty hunter. I'm just a bounty hunter, but also as a anytime someone throws a big bash in Saginaw, they hire him as a bouncer. He's a bad boy. <laughs> James always lets me know, hey, Pop, when you're gone, I got, I got mom and I got sis. Ain't nobody going to get to him in church. I said, okay, son, thank you. <laughs> I don't worry about my wife and daughter. I mean, you know, someone comes in the building with a gun, you know, there's going to be about 30 knives come out. <laughs> Everybody packing something. <laughs> so when he first came to our church, uh, he was invited by a friend, and we were meeting at that time in, in a basement hall with like orange shag carpet and a big bar in the corner with mirrors all the way around. It was very unreligious. I, I miss it sometimes. And James came down. He was in the service. I was home, and I, I preached that night. And afterwards, his friend brought him up to meet me. And he said, now, I, I, I want you to meet a bishop. He's, he's not like a lot of these other preachers. And so James comes up, and he shakes my hand, and he doesn't say much. I look at him. I said, James, I said, uh, you know that God is absolutely crazy about you? I said, you know, God's got this ridiculous purpose and plan for your life. And it doesn't matter what you did before you came to the service. And it doesn't matter what you do the moment you leave the service. It doesn't change God's mind about you. And he's going to prove it to you. And he just looked at me and said, you hearing me? He's like, man, it's hard for me to believe. I'm like, all right, well, God's going to show you. So he leaves the building, and about 10 minutes later, we're packing some stuff up, and I walk up the stairs, and I walk out the front door, and I walk into a cloud of pot smoke. Because James is standing right at the front door smoking a blunt. And my first response is, Whew, Lord, you told me you were taking me higher this year, but this is ridiculous. You know? <laughs> I didn't know it was literal, right? <laughs> smoke and I go whoa that takes me back 30 years well James <laughs> hears it and he hurry up and he's putting it out and he's hiding it and I noticed that remember I just told him no matter what you do directly after this service yeah. Yeah. God's not mad at you he's going to prove it to you so I walk over I put my arm around him I said James I bet you got the munchies he said huh I said let's go get something to eat I'm buying so he jumped in my car with me along with uh, the guy that brought him we went down Tony's Steakhouse we Order these steak sandwiches, and, and he and we're talking. He's looking across the table at me. His eyes are bloodshot, and he's just eating the steak sandwich. And finally, he looks at me and says, "You for real?" <laughs> I said, "What you mean, James?" He said, "Come on, man." He said, "You know, every preacher in this town would either kick me off the property or call the cops on me. You take me to eat because I got the munchies." <laughs> I said to him, I said, well, listen, if I'm going to judge you for smoking some, 
And I got to tell all the self righteous people they can't come back anymore. I got to tell all the prideful people they can't come back. I got to tell anybody that's overweight they're not welcome in our building anymore. Yeah. I said, The truth is, I mean, what sin do I need to stop at? I, I, I said, You know what? Listen, when I was growing up in the church, if someone was standing outside smoking, people would walk out the door, look down their nose at them on the way to the buffet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. right. we thought the Lord was telling us to buffet our body, not to buffet it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, woo, I claim that scripture in Jesus' name. Paul said, buffet your body. <laughs> Amen. After the holidays. Huh? After the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> And I grabbed him. I said, I, I want you to do me a favor if you would. He said, what's that? I said, we got kids that come out in and out of the store. Uh, if you need to do this, if you just make sure to go around the corner and do it, not at the front door. And he said, no problem. Hardly miss the service. He's the one I walk up to all the time. You're better than you think you are. He's gone through his times. He's gone through his seasons. I mean, you know, I mean, he'd start working at the Chinese buffet. And all of a sudden, he's putting five bucks a week in the offering. And all of a sudden... A couple C notes get dropped in, and I'm like calling them on the phone, saying, "You start hustling again, because I I know you didn't make it at the Chinese buffet." So with yeah. <laughs> a couple C notes showed up, I know that didn't happen from that job. Or what you do? Oh, pop man, yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. I, I was like, "Listen, son, man, I love you regardless. God's love for you does not change according to your behavior, but you're better than that." You're better than that. You're, you're not the righteousness of God in Christ. You're a son of the king, man. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm, I'm better than that. See, we have, we have a choice. We can choose to put in fear. Right. Or we can choose to put in love. Mm. Because love removes fear, but fear removes love. And I'm... In this season of my life, I just decided if I'm ever going to be in an error, it's always going to be on the side of love. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't think anybody will get to heaven someday and God look at them and say, I'm sorry, you love too much. Yeah. Or you know what? You preached I was too nice. I, I just don't think anybody's going to hear that. I don't think anybody's going to be. I don't think God is ever going to look at anybody and say, you preached I was too good. Perfect love removes all fear. Mm -hmm. Fear leads to torment. But he who still fears has not matured in love. Amen. We Amen. love because he first loved us. Mm -hmm. By your heads a moment, would you? Father, I thank you tonight. And I thank you for your absolute amazing love for us. Thank you, Lord, that your love is not contingent on ours. Your love is fully contingent on your love for us. It's not contingent on our faithfulness. It's on your faithfulness. So, Lord, I ask for every person in here that you would just remove the wrong ideas about you. Remove the fear. That you are not a father that we have to be afraid of. That we don't have to run and hide when your presence shows up. But we can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. That we don't have to run from our father. We can run directly to our father's lap and he will in no wise cast us out. And his heart is always chasing us down. His heart is always for us. His amazing, reckless love. That beautiful, reckless love that is constantly running after us rather than running from us. So Holy Spirit, I ask that your love would manifest in your sons and daughters tonight. In the name of Jesus. I want you to do something. Would you just lift your hands? But I want you to lift your hands like this. Like a little child. Like you're in a a receiving motion, not, not a getting, but a simple receiving. And I want you to pray this out loud with me, if you would. Father, in Jesus' name, 
Jesus. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your love. I receive your love. I receive your love. Fresh in my life. Fresh in my life. Remove all fear. Remove all fear. And manifest your goodness. And manifest your goodness. Manifest your love. Manifest your love. Teach me. Teach me. To know. To know. What your love really is. What your love really is. Let that liquid love. Let that liquid love. Transform my life. Transform my life. Let it pour over me. Let it pour over me. Let it transform me. Let it transform me. I receive it tonight. I receive it tonight. By faith. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. Come on, just love him for a moment and worship him. Father, we just thank you for your love. But we just receive your amazing goodness, Lord. Your your love that is never ending. Your love that is transforming. That reckless love that chases us down, that leaves the 99. Just to run after us, Father, we thank you for your absolute, amazing, ridiculous, radical relentless, reckless love that changes us from glory to glory. From faith to faith, we thank you. We thank you for your love, Father. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We bless you for that. We bless you for that. In the name of Jesus. Um, I, I heard this just to encourage the two of you. And uh, I know what Jordan already here. You guys had probably received 30 prophecies each. <laughs> Who wears me out with that boy loves to prophesy. Yeah, yeah. I've been around so much, I love to prophesy in my entire life. Yeah. So, but when I was in my 30s, that was probably me too. Just, that was talking about, I just had a lot of shit. But I, I, I just kept hearing this. Of course, you know, I know uh, we have the same first name. And James comes from a derivative of James, which is truthful. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just kept hearing over the two of you, Sons of Thunder. Oh, wow. Sons of Thunder. Not because wow. one wants the right hand and one wants the left, but there's a thunder that comes from a secret place. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it, it's a message of grace. It's yeah. a message of God's love. Yeah. It's, it's literally a thunderous love. Listen, the reason that people are being attracted here, it's, it, it, it's not because of the show. It's it's because of the love that they're experiencing. It's the love that is emulating it. And and the work that God has done in both y'all hearts is getting ready to just exponentially explode. I'm telling you, that liquid love I talk about, I, I'm telling you, but, but even before the end of this year, not only it's going to tangibly be seen, but you're just going to get around people, and all of a sudden, they're just going to come up like Patrick and say, whoa, what in the world was that? Because it's 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 a tangible thing, and, and, and God's heart is not only for transformation, but it's about the removing of fear. And Father's already been removing fear just from your lives, but now... Uh, the sons of thunder that don't want to call fire down to destroy cities, but the sons of thunder that are going to heal cities, to transform cities. But Father wants you to know that in his heart, he legitimizes you. He legitimizes you. I thank, thank God that God's begin to bring fathers around you. But Father wants you to know you're his sons and who he is well pleased. And he legitimizes you no matter what anyone has said from the past. Amen. And it's going to be the fruit of that love that you're going to see demonstrated. Amen. Everybody, would you stretch your hands towards them? Father, I just release a fresh grace. Father, over this precious son of yours. Father, I declare tangible, beautiful, Yes. Glorious yes. agape, Father. Being seen, Father, yes. flowing through his heart, flowing yes. through his voice. Father, I just release that grace. Father, on both of these, Father, yes. sons of God, Father, I thank you, Father, for that teaching grace. The pastor's heart. Yes. Father, that, that love manifested, Father, to just be seen greater and greater, Father. That beautifully demonstrated yes. agape. You thank you for it, thank you. Thank you for it, Father. Uh, thank you. Sister, the Lord said this during worship to me. Uh, it, it was like all of a sudden I was seeing like uh, Jesus' mother Mary. 
and, and, and he was saying, uh, he was saying to the servants, go, whatever he says, do it. And, and what they did is they went and they got six water pots full of water. But then Jesus said, now draw it out. The water turned to wine, not in the pot, but once it was drawn out. You know, Isaiah chapter 12 puts it like this, with joy, therefore, draw water out of the wells of salvation. Uh, the world isn't thirsty just for water. Most are thirsty for wine. And when we get saved, we're full of water all the way up to the brim. Jesus fills us all the way up to the brim. Right. But then we draw it out by faith. Yeah. And when it's drawn out, the water turns into wine. Mm -hmm. and, and there's just this, just you are just a vat mm. of wine and joy. Yeah. And, and I just kept hearing that verse, beauty for ashes, yeah. the oil of joy for mourning, and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, because you've been through much. Mm -hmm. You've been through much pain. And because of much of what you've been through, it has literally squeezed this joy out of yeah. you. And you, you just, you're just a walking bubble of wine. Yes. <laughs> and it's just Amen. people just Amen. want to be around you. Yeah. It's just they can't help it. And Father wants you to know that man, not only has he done that, but it's, it's getting ready to just exponentially burst yeah. out of you where people are just going to be so attracted they're just going to come running and you're going to start hearing mama 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 you're, you're going to hear mama mama madecita you're going to hear mama 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 ma, ma, because the, the, the children uh, father wants you to know he doesn't want you he doesn't want you worried about them Come on, yeah. I want you to know that he's got him in the palm of his hand. Yes. Uh, he's seen your prayers. He's yeah. heard your heart. Yes. It's time to just rest now in his goodness. He's got him. Yeah. Yes, he does. He's got him. Yes, he does. Yes. Uh, and I just keep hearing that verse. I think it's I think it's in Colossians where it says, continue therefore in thanksgiving. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, just continue to thank God for what he promised you for your household. Mm -hmm. Yes. He's already heard it. Yeah. Now it's just Thanksgiving. Mm. Uh, praise finishes where prayer starts. Yes. Mm. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with Thanksgiving. Praise yes. Praise is the finisher. Yes. Yeah. You know, we pray, we supplicate, we, we yes. tell God you have not because you ask not, but then praise is the action of our faith yes. that says, I believe it and I receive it. Yes. Right. And Father wants you to know that you're going to see with your eyes. Yes. Of them in the kingdom. Ooh, children on. and children's children. Yes. Children and children's oh, children. That's, uh, that's his heart. Yeah. You and your whole house. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it will. Not just a part, but the whole house. Yeah. Amen. Mm. But I want to encourage also every parent here. Come on. Set a meeting with your kids. Get on your knees in front of them. Humble yourself. I shared the story about my son and I a couple of years ago in northern Michigan. About two weeks later, I had a man call me from southern Ohio, and he said, Sir, you don't know me. He said, I'm 62 years old. I got your number from my father's pastor. He said, my father is 92, and he attends a church up in northern Michigan. He said, I don't know anything about this God stuff and don't care. He said, all I know is you shared a story and my father and I have been estranged for 40 years wow so we've not talked for 40 years he said my father was waiting for me I was waiting for him I thought he's the father it's his responsibility and when the father heard me share that story the next day he drove all the way down to southern Ohio knocked on his son's door dropped to his knees and said please forgive me I have been proud I have been arrogant and I have been wrong. And the son dropped to his knees, sobbing, hugging his father. And he said, sir, I don't know about all this God stuff. All I do know is my father and I have reconnected. Amen. I'm like, if I, if I never told the story for anybody else, that was worth it for me. Yeah. I'm like, that's a beautiful story. Yeah. Because the truth is that man died about seven months later. Oh, wow. And that son would have probably thought the rest of his life, I wish, I, I wish we could have made that right yeah. Yeah. beforehand. Don't, don't, don't let your pride. Hey, children are blown away with yes. parents' humility. 
and I'm at a place now where I just, I have no problem. I tell my kids all the time, but listen, that was dumb. I'm sorry, I should have never done that. I come down the stairs here about a year and a half ago. My son was 20 years old at the time. And I start telling him, I'm going on this trip, do this, 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 this. He looked at me and he said, Dad, I am a grown man. You can't tell me what to do anymore. And I stopped and I said, you're absolutely right. You're right, son. You're grown. You're not a little kid in my house anymore. And I said, I ask your forgiveness and I need you to be patient with me because I'm trying to figure out how to have an adult relationship with you. <laughs> but son, you're right. If it had been four years before, I might have knocked him out. But anyway, <laughs> but he really wasn't trying to be disrespectful. He's just like, Dad, I'm grown. And I was like, man, you're right. My A personality five or six years ago, what? You want to talk to me, boy? Who do you think you are? Instead, my response was, man, and that was wrong of me. Son, you're right. God gives grace. Amen. To the humble, he resists the proud. You want to know why a lot of religious people have a hard time with the message of grace? It's because of their pride. Yes. Yeah. In, in spirit, let me say, religious pride is the worst pride on the planet. Yes. Absolutely just eat you up. Eat you up. Tear you to pieces. Try to destroy you. What do you do for a living? For most of what's for most of them? The, the like uh, they do, uh, they, they make like plastic. Gotcha. So, uh, All right. Um, man, the whole time I was preaching, I, I, every time I looked at you, I, I, I just kept, and God's put a, God's put a grace, it's put a grace of giving in you. Yeah, man, that's good. And man, I'm, 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 I'm telling you that nothing more frustrating to someone that has an actual gift and grace to give mm -hmm. is when they don't have it. Yeah. Is when they want to do so much more. They want to help so many more people. And, and, and the money's just not there. It's extremely frustrating. I mean, yes. you know, I mean, in my position, I, I literally weekly get emails and calls from around the nation of people that I'm connected with that need money for something. You know, and the kids go on a mission trip. It frustrates me sometimes when I can't, when I can't send everybody a thousand dollars anytime I want. Yeah. You know, um, it's just it's just frustrating at times because my heart is I want to be able to help everybody. But I, I just kept hearing the Father say this to encourage you: as you're faithful with little, uh, He's going to make you a ruler over much. Mm -hmm. You say you stay a faithful steward right where you're at. You keep showing up on time. You keep being faithful, mm -hmm. but also don't give up on your dream. Yeah. And fa Father put. Probably put a whole uh, dream and entrepreneurship and stuff in you a long time ago, and, and 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 sometimes what happens to us is 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 we just get comfortable uh, in our job, yeah. you know, and job is an acronym for just over broke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, it's, it's better to be just over broke than broke. All right? uh, yeah, that's I ain't saying you quit your job, okay? So yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's still good to keep a job, but God, God never gave Adam a job; He gave him work. That's right. mm. he, he, he put purpose in him. And there's, there's something that God puts in us that can produce abundance. Um, because that's, that's, uh, it's not only your desire to be able to do so much more, but Heavenly Father put that in there. And so don't give up on your dream. Don't, don't allow disappointment of the past when you tried stuff and it failed uh, to keep you from still moving forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's, it's time, Peter, to get out of the boat. <laughs> Come you know, on, I mean, it, that. You've been you you you've gotten a little comfortable in the boat a little bit. Yeah. And Father, watch out walking on the water. Because you, uh, you might sink, but remember, He'll always pick you up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Just just don't let fear rule you. Right. Let good. love rule you. Because mm -hmm. love will always re lead you in the right direction. And let me say this to encourage all of you here: I've never had I've never had peace and joy lead me in the wrong direction. I I teach this to sons and daughters, new all new believers all the time. You shall go forth with joy and be led forth with peace. Anytime you're making a decision relationally about work, major purchase, anything in your life, if you remember, if you're praying about it and there's peace inside you, you pray about it, there's joy and excitement to do it. Joy and peace are the kingdom. They will never lead you in the wrong direction. So always know. I mean, if you've got a tough decision, there's no joy, there's no peace. Hold up. If there's joy and peace, run. If there's no joy and peace, you better Better be careful right there uh, in, in those decisions. And the Father's going to lead you with 
Would you like peace? Mm, that's good. Hallelujah. Everybody lift your hands.